Um, welcome, everybody. This is Angelo for the Sacred Inclusion Network, and um, we're here to introduce um, uh, an event um, featuring Globe Trotter Robert Trom, um, who is um, doing a, a thing that we've abbreviated to call Post COVID Pathways to a Better World. And um, before I introduce Robert, um, I'd like us to do a brief um, attunement. Um, that um, Mr. Ian Lewis will do. Okay, yeah. Um, I'll lead on lead something basic since we're a few minutes over. We can do a four, seven, eight breathing. I love to start a call like that. But first, let's uh, ground. Let's feel our feet on the earth, or maybe our legs. Get in touch with our legs. Feel our butt and our feet. Just ground in, step into our body, and let's just take a minute and realize that we're about to take a journey, education, so our mind and our body. And so four, seven, eight breaths. First, you inhale for four seconds, and then you hold it for seven seconds, and then you exhale for eight seconds. And we're going to do that cycle. We'll maybe do it four to five times, and then uh, we can get started. So we can all do it on our own path. We don't have to lead. But I'm going to start with the inhale. All right, let's do our last cycle. Maybe. All right, back to you, Angelo. Yeah, I'd just like to introduce uh, Robert. <clears throat> Robert is a co-founder of United Earth. <clears throat> He's the coordinator of the World Summit Movement. He um, is an activist at hackhumanity.net. Um, he's a host of the Future Now Radio and is a documented producer of three um, films, some of which we'll see today, called The Great Pause. And he's been active um, for in a number of fronts uh, ever since I've known him. Um, sort of a master networker and um, person that I admire who were, who's working towards um, um, co-creating a better world. Um, Robert, um, welcome to our exploration. Thanks so much, uh, Angelo. Uh, delighted to be here, of course. And uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this session of uh, Post-COVID Pathways to a Better World initiated by the Sacred Inclusion Network and uh, Hack Humanity. So let me start with the purpose of the event. And we're here to explore interconnected solutions for the post-pandemic world. During the exploration, uh, we will show part of, uh, like Angelo mentioned, the docu-series that me and my colleagues at Hack Humanity created called The Great Pause. And the series delves into the meaning and transformative potential of the past, which was COVID-19. The global pandemic brought our world to a screeching halt, exposing the precarious nature of our interconnected yet unsustainable systems. As we emerge from this unprecedented time of stillness, we have a unique opportunity to apply the lessons we learned during the great pause. Um, 
In this session, we will reflect on key insights from the pandemic about our global systems and society. We will explore how the Great Pause can inform our vision for the future. We will discuss tangible ways to advance equity, sustainability and community resilience. And we will hopefully leave inspired after our collective potential to drive change. Um, I will share an overview of the program in uh, the chat. So we all have an idea what will happen. And we will start, of course, uh, with the introduction. Uh, session one will be the shift from sustainability to uh, regeneration. Uh, session two, part two, for 15 minutes, exploring future scenarios. Uh, session three will be about transition tactics and session four about activating the critical mass. And then we have sort of a last session, of, uh, what can be part of the solution. We will talk about Regen Campus, uh, a sort of village for change makers yeah, to come pads, together. Missing, so what, what right. is happy pads? I think Kimberly is here and we have to probably mute someone, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then at the end, we can uh, find a conclusion together, hopefully. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so what we are doing, like I said, we want to explore interconnected solutions for the post-pandemic world and also acknowledge the challenges we face. I think we can say we are aware of what our current uh, problems are, our challenges. And uh, we know that Earth Overshoot Day happens sooner every year. We use uh, two to three to maybe even four times the resources that the Earth can carry with our current uh, degenerative consuming models. So they're not sustainable, they're not regenerative, but there are lots of uh, hopeful, optimistic uh, solutions we can review. Um, and of course, we want to sort of together take a look at holistic solutions. Uh, our problems and challenges don't stop at our borders. We're all on the tiny planet, so let's uh, figure this out together. Just as an introduction, because we're going to play uh, the Great Pulse Part 1 video uh, in a few minutes. Um, yeah, what does it mean? Uh, you know, uh, after COVID-19, uh, the world was brought to a complete standstill. And as it spread with unprecedented speed across the world, it showed us uh, precariously we are perched at the intersection of globalization, environmental degradation and disaster. It unmasked the unsustainable nature of the current business as usual way of being in the world and its non-responsive ways of dealing with issues like climate change, uh, income inequality and structural racism. In this uh, experiential exploration, we'll examine what we learned from the great pause of the global pandemic. And we'll then explore the critical question of what, what we might do to, with that what we have learned. After showing an excerpt from the docu-series, we'll use the framework of what visionary activist Joanna Macy calls the three pillars of activism to explore how each of us might participate in the recreation of a sustainable world. And this is actually within our reach. Uh, so the question is, uh, we are at the time, even uh, after going back to business as usual from over a year ago, it still feels that we are in, a, in the great pass, and which brings up the question, where can we collectively go next? In part one, which are we going to play now, we put a critical lens on the current failing system, showing why it doesn't make sense to go back to the degenerative abnormal normal. I will start uh, with a bit of technical points by sharing the screen and share the sound and let's see. Yeah. We can play the first part. I 
takes uh, some time to load, probably. Yeah, here we are. At no other time ever in our lives have we gotten the opportunity to see what would happen if the world simply stopped. Here it is. We're in it. Stores are closed. Restaurants are empty. Streets and six-lane highways are barren. A carless Los Angeles has clear blue skies as pollution has simply stopped. In a quiet New York, you can hear the birds chirp in the middle of Madison Avenue. Coyotes have been spotted on the Golden Gate Bridge. And because it is rarer than rare, it has brought to light all of the beautiful and painful truths of how we live. And that feels really weird, really weird, because it has never happened before. If we want to create a better world for our kids, we have to pay attention to how we feel right now. Even with an enormous number of people hidden away, not working, we can still get food on the shelves and keep the lights on. Has anyone else noticed how little is unavailable with so many people in isolation? The old normal was abnormal, and we all experienced the stress of our unsustainable system. Our society was based on artificial values that were traded on the stock market in a system which requires everyone to be slaving away often doing redundant or unnecessary things to create productivity. Most of our constant spinning on the hamster wheel was pointless. It made fake value for fake money. This is an appropriate time for sacred anger, which can activate us to say, no, no more. The biggest thing the rich are afraid of is you figuring out that we could all be moving a lot more slowly and getting along just fine. An efficient society would burn a lot slower. No hustle. If our entire economy wasn't dependent upon perpetually creating infinite growth within clearly finite systems, like our biosphere and available resources, perhaps we wouldn't have to choose between growth and a huge number of people dying for that illusion. If we build a society based on what we need, instead of what the endless programming has conditioned us to believe that we want, we wouldn't be ravenously consuming through every resource and drowning in the waste left behind. We could have everything that we need and a whole lot more. Imagine we reduced ourselves to the jobs we need, a few we want, and shared the tiny amount of essential labor remaining so nobody works that much at all. Instead of 70% of people being canned up inside, they share the work being done by the essential workers now. We have enough people at this point and enough automation, which is growing rapidly, that nobody should need to work 8 or 10 or 14 hours a day. It's absolutely exploitive to be slaving away at these made-up, bullshit jobs. We could see a world where a 15 to 20 hour week is standard and everybody has their needs met guaranteed. The illusion has been broken. So now, we call upon you to take the great pause as an opportunity to reflect and reconsider. Find value in yourself outside of your job and take back your time. Be rebelliously unproductive. Don't listen to the advocates of the abnormal normal when they call you back to the endless toil of business as usual. There is no usual anymore. Know that even when they tell you it's necessary, it isn't. We can support each other through mutual aid, and together we can be immovable. Instead of fear and worry, let's see this opportunity as a blessing in disguise, which can and will bring about a whole new level of freedom most of us have never experienced. This moment is a driver of the shift towards a better world for all. This is a revolution in lifestyle, a cultural paradigm shift. Stay tuned.
Yeah, I hope that uh, came through okay, I guess, uh, the sound and all. So, um, yeah, and I think we have to sort of recall that we made this in early 21. <laughs> so this was basically uh, after the, the, the first full year. And uh, of course, the world looked a lot different back then. So, um, and we can zoom in a bit. And maybe I would love to ask the people here if somebody feels like already giving a short reflection on what they have seen before we go uh, to review sustainability in relationship to regeneration. And yeah, um, I, I've been... Um... I've been reading a lot about um, China recently. And one of the things that I was reading about was um, their response to um, COVID-19. And um, one of the things among many things that happened was um, uh, they more or less um, kind of um, whitewashed the whole situation so that now um, someone can conceivably come up and think that, um, that millions of people did not die um, in their country as a result of that. So I'm thinking, I'm wondering, um, as you said, it's been a few years since this happened and it's already receding in the background of, um, us, those of us that live in a so-called free society. So I'm wondering, um, you know, how that impacts going forward or the incentive to go forward, uh, in a, in a more sustainable or regenerative way. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question and observation. Uh, I think uh, there are more examples, of course, where um, and yeah, the history books uh, are changed quite easily. Um, to be honest, uh, I think the the newer, the younger generations are, are like uh, uh, we experienced through generations uh, are more open towards change. And I can only say that hopefully, yeah, there is enough incentives there also among students uh, at universities to sort of keep keep an eye on what's really, what actually happened and that we don't forget too soon what happened. And the other end, I also think that although we try to forget that it happened, um, it's almost inevitable that we get caught up in a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. And that means that uh, at some point, and not to go into fear or anything, at some point we will experience an event like this again uh, with even deeper impact probably. So as I see it, the longer we try to ignore the, 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 the outcome of uh, our symptoms of the current models and systems that we have, the deeper the impact probably will be in the near future. But that's sort of how I sense it in, in an intuitive way. And uh, yeah, maybe we can reflect a bit more on it if somebody has some thoughts. Sure. Okay, yeah. I can go next. Um, so I watch all three videos already. Um, and I must say that it, it just resonates like everything I think about the world and, and I have seen and, and, you know, figure out and, and analyze about the world is basically summarized in the, in these videos. And, uh, it is very comforting to see that first, I'm not crazy and I'm not the only one thinking about these things. And, um, it is, yeah, it's it's just relieving to see that because here in my country, I, I don't have many like-minded folks mm -hmm. and that is, wow, that's like relieving. It's like, wow, okay. So, so yeah, there's other people seeing the exact same thing. And um, mm -hmm. the things that resonate the most uh, is uh, um, I am very, uh, attuned to to this um, statement of nobody works that much uh, that much at all anymore and, and, and that should be normalized because we're just going too fast yeah. Um, yeah I was already taking this mindset of becoming a rebelliously 
unproductive person. Um, I'll stop there because I don't want to take too much time. But, yeah. yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Arturo. Um, yeah, I think uh, David Graeber wrote a book about bullshit jobs. And uh, it's not to say that the people that do have these jobs are bullshit, okay? It's about the jobs that we actually, that are not relevant for uh, our yeah, support and our logistic uh, ways of means to supply and to feed ourselves and our survival. And um, he made clear that uh, uh, we only need 30% of the jobs we have now to keep things going, you know, the, vi the vital parts in it, uh, the logistics, uh, the healthcare and so on. So basically uh, it means that uh, 70 people could uh, do either something else or we can divide that workload of this 30% over the other, uh, yeah, the, the 400%, which means we all can, you know, do with working weeks of 21 hours. Um, there is an English Institute think tank that calculated that 21 hours a week makes people most happy. It's a perfect balance for work and uh, living conditions. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really astonishing to see that uh, we still hang on to this uh, artificial jobs where we can have a lot more relief. So thanks for that, Arturo, and uh, for being rebelliously unproductive. Uh, someone once shared with me that people could maybe be more like cats. Cats, they, they watch themselves, they play and they eat and they sleep. And uh, for the rest, yeah, they, people are uh, really um, taking a lot in the current systems from Earth. And uh, it was just something that came up for me now. Maybe um, we can follow through to the next topic. Uh, if nobody else wants to share some thoughts, we can go. Kimberly? Yeah, I'll just... Share. I mean, the way the conversation is is now, it just um, I don't know. I feel like slightly joyful, and that might be inappropriate, <laughs> but just that that vision. I mean, I've thought of this stuff like for a while. You know that I just don't think we're here to here to work our whole lives and then die. <laughs> you know. So so I've had that thought for for some time and um, just a, a vision of a way to really, you know, sense into what I also noticed in the film, right? The, not just the slowing down, but the, the beauty that's there, um, that's all around us, even in the chaos too. I mean, um, I just feel in my body that that feels just right. So thank you. I, I didn't actually know what this was today. I was curious about it. So um, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Kimberly. Yeah, and I, I do appreciate that you feel this, uh, this joyfulness because there is a lot of to be optimistic about. And maybe on the first side, you wouldn't say this when you watch the news, okay? Uh, and a, a lot of terrible things are happening with wars and so on and, and famine. But also we can put the lens on the positive solutions and see what's possible. So I'm, I'm very happy that you, you catch this feeling now because I think um, there are lots of things to be joyful about. And uh, let's focus on that for the, the coming uh, hour. Uh, I will share my screen again. I will show you some slides. Here we go. And we'll put this on. Okay, so we'll wait till it loads. Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about uh, SDGs. Most people know it as the Sustainable Development Goals. And still a lot of people haven't actually heard about them, but uh, they're coming from uh, the UN to sort of uh, yeah, transition towards sustainable ways of uh, living. There are 17 goals that they came up with almost uh, 10 years ago already. Um, 
And I want to discuss a bit about what it means if we want to design things sustainable, but also what it means if we would shift towards regenerative goals. And what is the difference? Uh, basically, you could say that a regenerative design is a way of designing a building, a village or a system where in principle you get more out of it than you actually put in. So and that's um, yeah the main, the main uh, difference. Uh, this is opposite to a degenerative design where we use more resources than we put in. Uh, and where there's um, obviously an energy and uh, waste leakage. So, and why is this important? Uh, here you can see some uh, bullet points about sustainability, where the focus is on maintaining and preserving current systems. Uh, it's about minimizing uh, damage or reducing negative impacts. Uh, sustainability is also maintaining the status quo in a way that doesn't compromise the future. And um, we have examples like recycling, energy efficiency, and reducing carbon emissions. Well, that being said, it's all good and well, but what is then regeneration? That has a focus on actively restoring and revitalizing ecosystems. Uh, it also is focusing on aiming to enhance and rebuild rather than just preserve. And the philosophy behind it is doing more good, not just less harm. So it's a different mindset. And last but not least, uh, reforestation um, and regenerative agriculture and uh, community uh, revitalization projects are examples. So, yeah, it, it's the next step. It, it's more inclusive. And, um, yeah, in essence, we can say that while sustainability aims to slow down or stop de uh, degradation, Regeneration seeks to reverse it. And that's a big difference. Um, we are going to talk a little bit later about the three pillars of activism. But um, I think for now, this is good. So we can pick up the discussion again. I will stop the sharing. Yeah, so any thoughts uh, in the group about this part? If not, uh, we can continue, if that's clear. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, we are flowing to the next session, session two, and we are going to explore future scenarios. Um, I think we will play part two of the Great Pulse a little bit later, so that's good. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, stepping stones, but basically we're going to review three different scenarios that could possibly happen within uh, the current uh, period that we uh, are experiencing. Uh, to just put it plainly and brief, we have three possible scenarios, and I'm naming only three for, uh, to review our discussion here. The first scenario that could happen uh, with our societies is implosion. That means uh, systems uh, crash. Um, we have a lot of chaos, uh, probably a lot of uh, negative side effects like famine and war. Certainly something that we don't want <laughs> together. So, but it is, it is a, a realistic uh, scenario option. The second one is that we shift uh, from uh, a degenerative system to regenerative systems. And we can do this within, with stepping stones. So a bit more uh, yeah, on the long term. So we can implement a number of solutions, which might take 10 or 20 years to shift towards more sustainable and regenerative models. And I want to review the last um, option here, the last possible scenario is a sudden shock. So when something like COVID happened, you could see that we were able to shift very quickly uh, 
in no time, in six months after the first shock waves, we a lot of people were working from their homes. Uh, we had to adapt very quickly. Uh, there was an enormous stress on healthcare. Uh, that yeah, so and it was an example that if we need to shift, we can do it. And I want to reflect with you guys uh, and to hear your thoughts about these different scenarios. And maybe you have another one to add. So. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I can share. For me, it's um, it's just kind of crazy to hear you say these things so flat out. Um, in yeah. a forum like this and I really appreciate it like everyone else said because these are all things that I've thought about a lot or enough the past 10 years and um, I don't know for me I think I've, I'm have trying to move past like trying to figure out which one is going to happen and just trying to put myself in like the best position that during it I can thrive and and that's why so I moved to Ecuador and I'm trying to live a more rural life in like a small community that is maybe a few steps in front of other places with like like-minded people thinking about things like this. And um, so that's, that's how I'm trying to, I guess, make a difference. And, um, but it really is re invigorating to hear someone like, like you speak flat out about these topics and create movies or documentaries to show people kind of what's happening and the way you just bluntly saying what happened, I think that's powerful and I appreciate it. Thanks Ian, uh, it's really good to hear. Uh, yeah, um, to be honest, I'm quite, uh, and maybe before we go to Susan, I saw you on mute. Okay. But yeah, as a short reflection, Susan, before you go, uh, I'm, 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 I'm quite, um, I see myself as uh, being a bit cautious in communicating using language that sort of is neutral. And I must say, in this case, um, I've grown past, past that. I think we need to be more clear and direct uh, towards each other. And uh, we can tell each other all kinds of, you know, nice stories and that make us feel better or less scared. I can understand that totally. But I think transparency is really needed uh, at these uh, times that we are experiencing. So thanks for that, Ian, for that confirmation. Uh, and of course, there are many, many people more that uh, are reaching this point of consciousness that let's just talk about what we actually what's happening and what we can do susan um uh, like ian i decided to leave uh, philadelphia leave a city and move out into the country in uh, <laughs> the quest for a rural and more grounded life i grew up in the 70s so it was back to the land movement so i feel like i'm i'm coming back to that <clears throat> what i'm experiencing is uh, a, a, in, in my community, there's a lot of lip service for you know, uh, recycling and getting EV cars and what have you. And I'm thinking, but what are we really doing? We can't all ditch our cars and get the latest model. Um, are we, we, I go to grocery stores and everything's in, wrapped in, in uh, plastic. And so I think I'm just creating more waste. Um, I think, what is it? We we give lip service. Uh, politicians aren't listening. Um, I really uh, am at a baffled by what I can do personally to effect a change within my community, within my county, within my state, <laughs> obviously within my country. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much uh, for that. Yeah. I think in essence. <laughs> It is. It comes down to, uh, and at least that's what I feel like sharing. Um, instead of uh, fighting symptoms, we have to get to the root causes. Okay, and be clear about it. And uh, of course, it's good that we recycle, um, circular economy, uh, also a lot of greenwashing going on. 
everything we do, even in a small scale in your personal life, it is important for sure. But it's important that we focus on the root causes. And that brings us back to why are we keeping these systems going? I don't want to put the blame on a certain system. I think the current systems brought us a lot of uh, you know welfare and uh, technological development. That's really great. Uh, but we have to also acknowledge and be frank about the fact that they are outdated and we can keep uh, using them or hold on to them till we feel there is maybe you know no use for it anymore. But like you say, most people or most politicians, uh, not to point the finger, but within our current systems, they're even not able to make really uh, prominent changes. So let's take a, a look at the root causes. We can talk a bit about it more later. I want to flow a bit to the next video unless someone else feels like putting in some thoughts. Okay, share the screen. Okay. And just to give you a, a brief introduction, uh, in part two of the great parts, we zoom in uh, on the possibilities of how we can solve our problems at the root cause level. The COVID-19 lockdown is a case study that proves that we indeed can change society very quickly if we have compelling reason to do so. Okay. COVID-19 has made a few things very clear. First, that our political and economic systems are not designed in the interest of human life. Second, that our environment is better off in the absence of commerce. And third, that our lifestyles are unhealthy and revolve too much around our jobs. Common among all of these revelations is that the underlying problems existed long before the COVID-19 pandemic. Before that, they manifested as conflicts in the Middle East, the refugee crisis, the Great Recession, the war on drugs, and climate change. What we are not seeing, or not willing to see, is that these catastrophes we find ourselves in are symptoms of our massively problematic socio-economic system. They are not anomalies. These catastrophes will not stop until we address the underlying cause. In fact, these catastrophes will continue to get worse. Normal was the crisis. And that is why we cannot go back. We live in a world of great abundance. An abundance of land, food, shelter, and technology. Technology, which is constantly increasing our capacity to produce said abundance. Yeah, we gave it a sec to uh, for the video to load. So it can continue. Could be a bandwidth uh, thingy here from this side. Yeah, and I think it's already uh, good to see, uh, you know, to be optimistic about the solutions. Uh, you can see here very briefly uh, an, an automatic building system, the 3D printing. Uh, I think this was three years ago, and at the moment we uh, can already print houses and offices like three stories high. So uh, that's really amazing. I hope this will work and otherwise if it takes too long we might have to shift Angelo to your side if you might be able to play it. Okay. <clears throat> have to get it up. 
Yeah, you can find it. Just give me a cue and I will stop sharing. All right, give me a second. Yeah, sure. Got so many um, videos from you, Robert. I don't know which one is which. Do you want me to share the link here? Uh, yeah, send me, the, send me, the, yeah, give me that's the simplest way. Yeah. Where are you, chat? There you go. Have you sent it to me? Yeah, this is the one. Uh... Yeah, send me, send me the link in the chat. Okay, maybe you can stop it, the video. Yes, I can do that. Okay. Okay, thanks. Give me a sec. This is all uh, part of uh, our exploration, of course. Uh, <laughs> there's always some technical unforeseen issues, but I learned to make peace with them. So here is part two. I'll put it in the chat link. All right. So you can play it, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, and maybe uh, don't forget to uh, the check screen. the box yeah, for the sound and also put it on full screen if possible. The Thanks. Sound. The great pause. Here we go. I don't know. All right, here we go. So, um, yeah. Can you put it on full screen? Yes. It's on the right. COVID-19 has made a few things very clear. First, that our political and economic systems are not designed in the interest of human life. Second, that our environment is better off in the absence of commerce. And third, that our lifestyles are unhealthy and revolve too much around our jobs. Common among all of these revelations is that the underlying problems existed long before the COVID-19 pandemic. Before that, they manifested as conflicts in the Middle East, the refugee crisis, the Great Recession, the war on drugs, and climate change. What we are not seeing, or not willing to see, is that these catastrophes we find ourselves in are symptoms of our massively problematic socioeconomic system. They are not anomalies. These catastrophes will not stop until we address the underlying cause. In fact, these catastrophes will continue to get worse. Normal was the crisis. And that is why we cannot go back. I don't get the the music, the it background music. But... Great abundance, an abundance of land, food, shelter, and technology. Technology, which is constantly increasing our capacity to produce said abundance. So why is it that so much of humanity lives in poverty? Why is it that a million tons of surplus rice and grain rot in silos? Why is it that hotels have enough vacant rooms to light up hearts while the homeless are given taped off slabs of concrete outside? And then out of the blue, governments approve trillion dollar aid packages and send checks to their citizens. It's proof that we have always been able to satisfy everyone's needs, but our inherently flawed system prevented it. It is the monetary market exchange system its underlying philosophy and rules that are the problem. Such a system survives by maintaining scarcity, not only a scarcity of products to keep prices high, but scarcity as a lifestyle and as an economic mindset. Governments are pushing to reopen the economy because the economy depends on the working class, something else that's been revealed, but also because governments know the working class can't afford to stay home. Yes, if we go to work, we might get and spread the virus, but if we don't go to work, we might starve. And we are seeing many people trying to exercise the minimal choice they have in a way that preserves some sense of dignity or honor. They are going back to work to put food on the table. 
unwilling to see themselves as victims. We want to call these people ignorant or irresponsible, but let's be clear, fellow members of the working class are not the enemy. It is now apparent that one of the main reasons COVID-19 spread so rapidly is because governments, such as those in the United States and China, laid down and even arguably covered up the severity of the coronavirus because they knew it was politically and economically devastating. It is no wonder that these countries were hit the hardest. Public health care and education, institutions that protect and empower the population, have been overlooked for decades. Governments are playing the only game they know how to play, one where resilience and sustainability are sacrificed for efficiency and productivity. We've seen this play out before, but on a much larger scale, climate change. We have known about it for decades and there have been almost no substantial systemic changes to address it. Conspiracy theories and disinformation peddled by the political and economic elite attempted to delay the inevitable. Both of them working together and working just as they were designed at our expense. We know that a growing economy corresponds directly to worsening environmental conditions. And now we also know that an economy on pause corresponds directly to improved environmental conditions. The normal we would return to was one that was already headed towards catastrophe. We must not return to normal because normal was the crisis. This begs the question, if not back to normal, then where? If not capitalism, then what? To answer that, we can look at the three pillars of activism by Joanna Macy, one way that we can identify what the alternatives are and how we get there. We must be willing to build new systems, facilitate shifts in consciousness, and prevent further harm in the meantime. All three pillars are critical, and no one form of activism will do the trick. The situation we are in now is essentially a case study, and a shift in consciousness is already occurring. The global test case has proven, for example, that our current systems are fragile, that we are capable of radically changing our lifestyles almost immediately, and that most of our jobs are non-essential. Not only do we spend an excessive amount of our lives working these jobs, but many contribute nothing to society. Many are superfluous, not created out of a need or demand or the well-being of humanity for that matter, but out of the desire to extract value. Value, most of which goes to the capitalist, not the worker. Here we are labeling jobs otherwise underpaid and undervalued by society as essential. This is why we need a massive values reassessment. COVID-19 is allowing us to realize that the true value is first and foremost in meeting our basic needs. It is in safety and belonging, connectedness with nature, ourselves, and our community. Having the time and energy to address these global challenges, however, is especially difficult for those they affect the most, those who don't have the luxury of seeing beyond their most essential daily needs. This is why holding actions are so important is they address those immediate needs and prevent worsening conditions for the most vulnerable populations. Climate strikes, rent strikes, supporting food banks, providing housing, universal health care and education would all be considered holding actions. A universal basic income, something we've seen implemented during the lockdown in countries around the world, is also a holding action. It holds governments responsible for helping to meet the basic needs of citizens. It could be a crucial step in the process of building a new, better alternative, because by meeting everybody's basic needs, we can break free from that oppressive, artificially generated cycle of scarcity and begin to think about the future. Holding actions make the revolutionary transformation accessible. However, they would be endless and futile if there weren't also people working to address the root causes of such inequities. The third pillar is to build new political and economic systems. Part of shifting the consciousness is to break from this rigid dichotomy of capitalism versus communism, democracy or autocracy. There is in reality a whole world of possibilities with historical precedent and evidence to back them up. Many activist groups are now organizing to align and synchronize their efforts because they too see and understand 
there are so many great regenerative ideas that make sense. We must be willing to embrace them, knowing that the status quo just won't do. A universal basic income paired with a 20 hour work week can help us transition to something even more prosperous, like an open access economy, where we shift from ownership to stewardship, having access to basic goods and services whenever and however we need them without a price tag, finally benefiting collectively from the abundance our world provides. As COVID-19 has proven, we are able to maintain essential infrastructure, even with far less people going to work. We were all forced into the great pause, but now as they beckon us, we have a choice, knowing more clearly than before, just how empowered we are. We could dismantle our degenerative systems simply by us choosing not to go back. No problem can be solved with the same consciousness that created it. We are in a raging river, scared and holding onto a branch, battered by the rapids. Only when we recognize that our system of government and our economic systems are not only outdated and flawed in their design, can we let go, scary as it may be. But we can take solace in the fact that we have somewhere to go, things to do, and that is designing a new system that makes the existing one obsolete. We are already in the chrysalis, so to speak. That much is true. Now, whether we emerge a beautiful new creation is up to us. Stay tuned. Yeah. Thanks uh, for playing the video, uh, Angelo. Uh, I, for some reason, I couldn't hear the inspiring background music, but maybe it was okay for you guys. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I would love to ask uh, if somebody feels like reflecting some thoughts. Maybe, Bill, you have some? Uh... Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I mean, of course, I agree with all the, the need for uh, systems changes, you know, for the creation of new systems that was uh, brought up. And of course, for holding actions and shift in consciousness. Um, concerning the shift in consciousness, um, you know, I think in the Sacred Inclusion Network, we've, we've often talked about this, you know, that um, there is also a you know, spiritual dimension to, to this. Uh, that needs to be included. Yeah. And, um, you know, most simply put, it's, um, you know, going uh, beyond uh, our ego needs and our ego defenses, uh, which, of course, are useful at times, but uh, not to be totally governed by those uh, needs, and to uh, shift into a more, um, you know, expansive and less contracted form of consciousness, in which we experience um, nature, you know, the cosmos, and other people as related to us, and even in some deeper sense, uh, one with us. Okay, so it, it seems that uh, the systems changes would need to be accompanied by and interact with uh, this uh, level of consciousness here, which you know we often call spiritual or or sacred or you know, uh, yeah. So I would, I would, I would uh, emphasize that. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Bill. Uh, what we are not uh, reviewing in uh, this uh, uh, exercise or session today is uh, that Barbara Marx Hubbard uh, designed the wheel of co-creation, where she envisions or shows society. Uh, being part of or um, existing in 13 or 12 different sectors. And of course, uh, like education, and uh, is one of them, uh, technology, healthcare, uh, ancient wisdom, but also spirituality. It's an important one. And um, there are 12 in total. And 
I think maybe for the next session, it would be great to zoom in on them, but they are all each sector, uh, even uh, you can include media and economics and governance, they're equally important and they are all interconnected. So whatever happens in one sector, it affects the other sector. Um, I think this is also the case with spirituality. I think it would be healthy to acknowledge that all these sectors are connected with each other, they affect each other. And maybe we should stop pretending like uh, technology will save the world. It's important. Uh, and education, no, it's education. No, we have to be more spiritual. Let's just be frank and say, we need all of the wisdom that is in there and all of the connections that we have together. We need them to uh, make this, this shift in consciousness to get to more regenerative models. And uh, I would love to uh, explore that more further. Maybe uh, if no one else feels like reflecting, we can zoom in a bit now on uh, these three pillars. I will share the screen. And... Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Joanna Macy, uh, and you, you've seen this flashing in the video. She came up with this uh, three pillars of activism. And basically, you can see that uh, the holding actions pillar where all the protest groups are, uh, Black Lives Matter, Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion, and so on. They are uh, confronting us with the symptoms. So people are there going out on the streets and saying no more. You know, we don't want this anymore. That's it. It's protest and civil disobedience fighting the system and stopping the damage right now. Then you see uh, the orange one on the left bottom, the shifts in consciousness. There are a lot of people, change makers, thought leaders with brilliant, uh, beautiful ideas, solutions, concepts, and uh, we are sharing them. Uh, we can see them on TEDx. We can share them through uh, media, uh, but there are a lot of new concepts which can help us to make the shifts in consciousness and also that we can let go more of our conditioned beliefs. Um, so that's the shifts in consciousness pillar. And then we have the new systems pillar. There are over uh, uh, hundred thousands of uh, groups, platforms, people, millions of people working on building new tools. And these tools are uh, used to implement them in new systems and they are addressing root causes. So it could be an app, it could be a, a blockchain technology, it could be a, a something with a robot. A lot of groups are uh, putting a focus on that. And what Joanna Macy is saying that, uh, yes, it's important to protest. And certainly, yes, it's amazing that we have the shifts in consciousness and that people build new systems wow that's far out you know uh, let them do it but what she is saying is that most of the pillars the three are working in silos that means uh, they're not really interacting with each other and supporting each other so basically she's saying if you protest for something uh, come up with the solution so bring the solution also, what, what the new concept uh, can be or should be, and also build the tool to implement it. Uh, and that makes it important how we sort of can um, spark this critical mass that's already there. There are about half a million to a million active platforms and groups and organizations and everyone, uh, like we just briefly reviewed in the separate sector, of the 12 or 13 sectors are focusing on their specific important part. But um, I think reaching this critical mass, which is maybe about three to five to 10% of uh, all the people that are working towards creating better models. And that's the one part that we can be very optimistic about and uh, happy about. Yes, they, we have to find a way sort of to make them work in symbiosis together. So again, 
yes, let's protest, but also bring in the solution and implement and bring in the tool to implement the solution. I think that's an important part of it. Um, basically, uh, uh, yeah, shifting, like we discussed before, from fighting symptoms towards addressing the root causes and suggesting holistic models. And uh, we can do this through a number of transition tactics. I would love to hear ideas from you, what we might do, but uh, like Milton Friedman said, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. A lot of ideas are lying around for a long time. Here are just a few. Uh, with the Hack Humanity Group and a lot of other groups, we came to uh, our 10 uh, regenerative development goals, transition tactics, not to say this is the solution, we should do it this way, because we found over 60, there are way more, but it's to show that there are solutions that we can implement right now if we would be able to do it together. Okay, the first one is to meet everyone's basic needs. And uh, you could implement universal basic services or universal basic income. This is not the end solution, it's a stepping stone. It means uh, if you combine it with a 21 hour work week and job sharing of essential work, there is a recalibration, a rebalance in the whole system. A lot of people will feel happy with that. Uh, again, it's a stepping stone. Uh, creating a mutual aid network to provide basic needs is one of them. Create safe communities for your racism and discrimination. We, have, uh, uh, we can talk about global citizenship and world passports. You know, in addition, maybe to our country passports, it doesn't mean that if we have a world passport uh, that we lose our identity. It's just to show that we are interconnected and we, that we are thinking on holistic solutions. We can eliminate hunger. 30% of the food that we are producing is wasted or thrown away. It's not safe. Uh, water is, of course, very important. The redistribution and uh, keeping rivers and our water supplies clean is uh, very important. We can do it. Universal health care for everyone. In some countries, it's basic, it's free. Uh, it's something we can implement just like that. And homelessness. Uh, at least 20% of our buildings are empty. Uh, empty hotels, empty um, uh, utility buildings, empty hospitals. We could repurpose them. We could renovate them. We can give everyone a sheltered home if we want to. In some Southern European countries, thousands of villages are empty, abandoned, because the youth left the villages to find work in the big cities. So let's think about that. Um, of course, we can end the refugee crisis. We still read every day that people um, step into unsafe boats to cross the ocean to find a better destiny there, and they drown. That's not sane, people. That's insane. It, we should not let this happen at all. Uh, we can implement uh, eight forms of capital. That's another uh, review discussion, because beside fiat capital, we have seven other forms of capital. Spirituality is one of them. Uh, intellectual capital. We have experiential capital. Uh, there's a lot more resources there. Uh, and also, yeah, if we take a look at our current political systems, they were great for a while, but let's see now with help of technology that we can arrive at decisions also with support of artificial intelligence. Doesn't mean that we give our decisions to uh, a, a, an AI learning program. No, they can support us in making uh, decisions. We will always be at the driver's seat. Humans will always have the last say, but they can help us in showing us the best way and solutions. Okay. I think that's for now. Uh, yeah, we implemented 60 of these transition tactics uh, and I'm sure there are a lot more and I would love to hear uh, some of your 
thoughts on what we have and I will start sharing the screen. Yeah, one of the um, um, encouraging things is that um, in one of the uh, Hack Humanity slides or something, there's all these other organizations that are, um, you know, working towards some of these things that you um, uh, mentioned, um, Robert. And um, so that's that's the encouraging thing. The other side of it is that there's there's so much fragmentation. And one of the things that's beautiful about what you're doing is that you it seems that um, if I'm reading you correctly, um, you are uh, attempting to um, arrive at integration um, involving all these different actors. And at the same time, I can't help thinking that the root cause uh, for all these different um, sub um, problems, um, racism, economic disaster, um, income inequality, et cetera, um, is man's ego. The, the sense that we're separate, we feel that we're separate from, from all these other problems and separate from all these other things. And I guess it's my belief that unless, uh, and I don't know how to get there, unless we kind of um, 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 grow out of this um, sense of separateness that we, we experience, um, we're not going to get to any of these, these different things. So, I mean, I don't agree with um, how, uh, for example, um, Sharif Abdullah is doing his thing I don't think it will work. Um, but um, he, to, I, to, the thing that I applaud about it is that um, um, he also sees that this is the root cause. Um, you know, and, and it is the root cause. We can solve all these things, but unless we feel that we're interconnected, unless we deeply um, believe and experience that, it's like um, none of these things will change. That's my that's my thought. Yeah. Wonderful, Angelo. Uh, I would love to reflect on it now, uh, if you uh, let me. Um, you know, one of the basic uh, root causes or uh, symptoms that we experience is uh, safety. So the, the lack of psychological safety and also not meeting our basic needs. Okay, having shelter. I think if you take a look at uh, racism, uh, and maybe you're aware of the redlining concept that uh, in some suburbs, in cities, um, some financial institutes at some point started redlining uh, neighborhoods that have more risks uh, where you should not invest your money in. It also uh, uh, contains with certain school areas. So it means that people who are living in these redlined um, areas already uh, sort of are confronted with less investment in their environment. So um, the prosperity in their development, their, their chances is less. That means that their basic needs um, are uh, that can be met are also these chances are less. So it sort of creates the incentive of creating a barrier because when people uh, basic needs are not met and they don't feel safe, you form a sort of protective shield around yourself, a membrane. So once you can open this field up and give people these basic needs and give them this psychological safety and equality, then you automatically can, uh, and I'm not speaking like a psychologist, but you can lower these barriers, these illusionary barriers often that are there. I think that maybe touches on, 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 on an important aspect. But again, uh, yeah, I don't feel that I'm the expert to say this is the solution, but it makes sense that it's part of a solution. Yeah. But thanks, thanks for sharing that. And uh, yeah, so in, in my realm, uh, when we experience that we are more connected, that we are treated equally, then this will automatically, in a way, help us to overcome our barriers of uh, having feeling these differences and uh, uh, our consciousness that we are part of a holistic system. Maybe somebody else feels like uh, sharing some more reflections. Yes, uh, I was about to say the same thing as, as Angelo did. Um, I think it's an ego problem in... I think yeah. that our biggest challenge is, of course, the current establishment and the political systems, and they don't want to lose their status quo. And 
I've been reflecting a lot about about how to approach these people because um they 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 I think they see us as our as their enemies, you know, as their biggest enemies because their status quo is being um questioned and they don't want to stop being the king or the pope. Um so one ex exercise I, I like to do is um, when I meet someone who I consider, you know, my enemy, which I know they're not my enemy, it's just a different um, point of view for the world. Um, I always start from from the basic fact that what animates them animates me as well, because they are humanity and I am humanity and, and I cannot separate myself from all of the bad. I am the bad as well as the good. So mm. um, I think it's a starting point, um, um, a way to reach the politician and, and say, hey, Mr. President, I, I, I am not your your your. Um, your um, enemy. enemy. I, I am the same as you are. So, so, uh, and I think that's key because they are the ones running the, the planet. Mm. They are the ones running the planet. So, um, yeah, uh, I have so much to say. I don't want to take too much time, but the, <laughs> well, what, everything you, you, you shared in your video, it's like the Venus project one-on-one -on -one all over again. Uh, except from, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's all of the same, and there are so many solutions out there. I saw the other day a 16-year-old genius from California that designed a, a city uh, for the like like an entire city that you could put um, on the sea and just literally clean the the the, the entire island of uh, garbage that we have between the um, America and and Asia. So, um, yep. yeah, I'll stop there. So thanks Arturo. Yeah. I know there's lots to say about it. Yeah. I think, um, ego, uh, for sure. Uh, I, I, I connected often to uh, dogma because I sense in essence, we have a lot of dogmatic patterns that we keep, uh, you know, doing things over and over again. Um, and that's connected to our attachments. Uh, it's if you want to change, it's you have to let go of your attachments, and that's not an easy thing. I once did an experiment with it. We even invented a helmet uh, with magnets on it, and the magnets were our attachments. And every time that we had to pull them off, like you know, what do you identify with? Your job, your name, your skin color, and so on. It's really strange. We are. We have these attachments and uh, the, the thing is maybe more, how can we learn to be more flexible with our attachments instead of being having this fear of losing them? But certainly, uh, uh, yeah, ego is one of them and dogma. And let's not forget also that within the current systems, you know, it almost incentivizes, um, the incentive is there to create sociopathic behavior. And... It doesn't mean that, you know, the people who sort of are in this vacuum are bad people. They, they, they just experience this dissonance from, yeah, and we can see this in politics also. There is a dissonance between what the people actually, you know, want from life and how politics want to run uh, the systems and the world. I think... Uh, this disassociation and the sociopathic behavior, um, it can be supported. We can help them. And I agree, it's not about you are the enemy. Maybe we can offer, hey guys, how can we support you in our current transformation? How can we reform our systems that we don't throw everything out, the baby with the bathwater, but also keep the good things? And so they don't have to be afraid of losing everything or their uh, ways of influence. So thanks for that. Um, if no one has any further reflections, I would like to go to the last part. Can I? Uh, can I just add one? Yes, Kimberly, please. 
Well, you're speaking of now reminds me of something from one of the presentations on the um, that mentioned the our uh, massive um, reexamination of our values, yeah. right? And um, like the creating spaciousness for that, right? So, so to, to counter the scarcity, like creating space and time to allow for these shifts in consciousness to occur, whether it's by you're talking consciousness of just learning like what the existence is in a different place right now, like the Congo or, or you know, where there's already a million refugees, like those different scenarios, I think, depending on where you look, are, they're all here. Um, but but or, or or the shifts in consciousness, if we call it spiritual or, or or whatever that we you know attune to, where we you know can have our own insights or just be aware of things or perceive more in a different way, kind of restoring a kinship worldview. Um, I think it's just from it feels like just space and time and creating that because we're so conditioned anyways and especially toward work at least where I am and um, creating these spaces and maybe in the form of massive values re-examinations while change is upon us with climate and everything else um, is a nice way of being in service yeah. to what the new that what new wants to be born yeah fantastic Kimberly totally aligned with that the, the the question might be but how do we do this okay so i will love to take you to a project that we are a concept that we are running at the moment i will share the screen and we can take a look at yeah so how do we do that we talked about the critical mass uh, all these uh, uh, half a million to a million active groups and basically, you can say they are working in silos, but they're just focusing on their specific thing, what brings them joy and happiness to focus on that part of the solution. Um, but we can also say that, um, yeah, most, most of them work in silos. There are groups working on solutions and they the same solutions, and they don't even know about each other's existence. So. How do we uh, find each other? There are several uh, platforms around the world that are busy with mapping. So there are over a thousand different maps of all these activities happening. But that's just one step on, you know, on the front side to make visible what is happening in the world. The next step or what could be a simultaneous uh, effort and step is how do we connect on the back end all these uh, energies? And uh, this is where we're talking about a Regen Campus project. And uh, I hope it will follow up. And sometimes, yeah, I think Angelo, maybe you might have to open this too. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Can you send me the direct link? Yeah. I'll stop sharing. See if I can find it here. Maybe you still have the document at hand that I share with oh, you. I before. do, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if this is the right one or not. <clears throat> All right, let me share my screen and we're going to have to figure it out, Robert. Yeah, yeah. All right, this is the one that I'm looking at now. I have to share the sound. I don't know about the sound. Uh, there's no sound that goes with it. So okay, it good. Okay. So, yeah. Anyway, this is, the, this is the one that... Oops. With the blue the blue first light. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, um, it's um going around like this, waiting for... Okay. It's probably doing the same thing on your end. It's... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's probably a bandwidth thing. So oh, here we go. All right, can you see that? Yes. So this is what I'm looking at. 
Uh, yes, but there should be a slide deck. Slide deck, okay. Unfortunately, I have 35 different things open. Mm -hmm. Slide deck. This wouldn't be on this. Oh, no. It's just part of the process. Thank you. Um, did I have the, let me see. I can, wait, I can put the link here in the, let's do it like this. I can yeah, put the link right. here in the chat box. Okay, please. Yeah, because it now came back from my screen. And uh, everybody feel free to open the, you know, the slide deck and take a look at it later. Yeah, it's in. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, you can go to the next slide, put it on full screen. Okay. Would be great. Pull it on full screen. Ah. Slideshow on the right top. Okay. <clears throat> Whoops. A bit lower. I have everybody okay. uh, everybody's faces on my right screen. A bit lower. If you can remove the sidebar. Yeah. You're just assuming that I'm as adept at you at these things as you are. How do I get uh, Maybe you can click on the slide. Yeah, you can see slideshow beside the uh, share on the right top in the white field. The white field. Okay. A bit lower, lower. You yes. Right there we Slide go. Sh slideshow. Hey. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, yeah, maybe you can just skip through the slides. Yeah, okay. okay, stop here. So this is uh, what we want to do in Asheville. There's a lot of uh, transformative energies happening. Uh, Charles Eisenstein used to live there. Daniel Smachtenberger, one of uh, yeah, the most prominent thought leaders of this time, is creating an academy nearby Asheville. We want to build a region campus there. So basically we found a partner in building regenerative villages. Um, between 8 to 12 weeks, they can build 77 uh, homes. You can see the concept here. They build some uh, models in Europe, but it works uh, only when people have uh, land to offer, free, free, debt-free land, where we can uh, build these uh, homes. It, uh, people who live there pay rent. It's very simple. Basically, uh, the whole project is bootstrapping itself. And um, because people pay the rent is all, are also for 50% financing the building costs and there are green funds. I, don't, I will not go into all the tech, but maybe next slide. Yeah, here you can see uh, these uh, 13 sectors that we talked about, which are all connected and influence each other. In the middle, you can see love and sexuality that goes through all the sectors, as we know. And uh, yeah. What do we want to do there? Next slide, please. We want to uh, create feedback loops. And how do we do it? Let's bring a lot of people together in a physical place. We can do a lot online. We can do magic online. People have been co-creating for many, many years since the internet. But having a physical research and coordination center is very important to be in each other's knowledge fields and energetic space. Uh, let's bring the best uh, talents that are available and uh, the, the, the thought leaders, the, the change makers, but also people who are working on creating a better world. So it's not really, it's not about an elite bringing them together. It's about the people who actually feel this very strong drive, this calling, this mission, that that is the reason why they are following their path. Let's bring these energies uh, together uh, and review these interconnected sectors. Next slide. Yeah, and this is the goal to develop a region campus, a central hub for coordinating millions of projects. That's one step. And it's very ambitious. I will be honest, okay? But it's doable. Uh, the vision is, uh, uh, to synchronize and uh, align all these uh, different initiatives and energies. And uh, yeah, focus on research and coordination. Coordination, addressing systemic root causes. We do it, we build this village 100% CO2 neutral. 
it's a proven symptom system, 100% energy neutral and 100% knowledge sharing. That's very important because a lot of knowledge is stored in fragmented silos. Next slide. I see we're almost uh, at the end, but like uh, mentioned, many, many groups, maybe you can skip a bit more and I can say stop, Angelo. These are one of these platforms, an example of all the amazing groups, clustering platforms all around the world. That's what we want to coordinate. I didn't mention that I am a coordinator by heart and nature, so uh, I would love to be part of a team. I think I'm already am, or we already are. So, Next slide. Yeah, we are researching capital. Next slide. Here are the eight forms. So maybe it's time to evolve from financial capital only to also include the other forms and see how can they interact with each other. We are already doing it. We are not aware of conscious of it fully and we are not acknowledging these values. So maybe it's time. Next slide. Yeah, social material, financial, living, intellectual, experiential, spiritual and cultural. There are two or three more. Somebody even mentioned humor as a form of capital. I agree. It's important. Next slide. Uh, yes, forms, uh, ways, researching, how can we uh, create these new systems and models? Next slide. With help of tokens and blockchain technology and a hollow chain. Uh, yeah, maybe this is interesting and I'll keep it brief before we have to close. How would this work in practice? Next slide. Yeah, so as hard as it was to predict how computers and internet would change our lives, we now see it happening with blockchain and holochain technology, but also uh, yeah, with AI and chat GPT. So maybe the next slide will show you a brief picture what that would look like. You know, We started in the 60s with the ATM, the automatic teller machine. Um, it evolved uh, uh, through the years uh, 90s to, and 2000. We got to Bitcoin and what will be the next phase? these eight forms of capital interacting with each other through a highly developed D-app. Next slide. Yeah, this sort of tells the story. Next slide, please. Yeah, again, the Regent Campus, there are uh, uh, two locations in development, one in Flat Rock and uh, one in Asheville. I would love to share more about it, but uh, we're uh, over the time. So maybe we should stop here. Um, the main idea is to, uh, you can stop sharing the screen, Angelo. Yeah, thanks. The main idea is we can bring all these brilliant concepts together and uh, yeah, let's spark the critical mass together. Thanks so far. I would, uh, maybe we can take a minute or two, Angelo, to, uh, to wrap it up and to, going to our final thoughts. So, yeah, from, from that perspective, uh, I feel very positive about the future. Uh, there are serious concerns, but I can see so many, so many positive, optimistic people that can really see and are working on these solutions that, uh, yeah, I'm hopeful, but I'm also trying to be realistic. It, it, it is something that needs to be done and uh, uh, together because uh, we're in it together. So nothing more to add from my side. Yeah, I'm, I'm just in awe of the work that you've done and um, look forward to being part of it. I don't know what else to say other than that. Um, and, uh, you know, I very much support the idea of a physical place. Um, there's only so much that can be done um, online. It's something that can be done faster. You, you think about the, um, it, it's not really a great ana analogy, but um, when they were developing, uh, what's his name? What's this film that Oppenheimer? 
they yeah. brought all these people on a campus and they were able to achieve uh, pretty much remarkable things simply because they had um, all these minds um, coordinated and uh, assembled in a particular place. Yeah, totally. And uh, thanks for that. And like I said, we partnered with the Warren Wilson University uh, near Asheville. We partnered uh, with uh, the Corvinus University in Budapest. I think it's important also to show students what the, the, the positive, the possibilities and solutions are. And uh, maybe that will help a little bit in uh, raising the consciousness. Bill, you wanted to reflect or? Yeah. I just think it's wonderful that you could, um, you know, do this presentation for us and, um, you know, bringing all this information together so that, you know, we do get a vision of, okay, you know, this is, this is how it looks. Um, you know, there, we've got both things going, you know, the, we have the concerns that are so huge and at the same time, so many people going for the solutions. And of course, you know, I feel, you know, like I'm a part of this, the solutions and I'm glad to be in, and as Arturo was saying before, you know, it, it makes you feel a lot better that, uh, you know, there are so many people working on these things. And, um, you know, in, a, in our own areas, we all do feel very isolated. And, um, you know, so we have to reach out online, online and through Zoom and everything like that. So I, I thank you so much. It's really wonderful. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Happy to be of service. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Robert. That's uh, a lot of work put on this project, and yeah, I really appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to. I just want to add one thing that uh, might seem irrelevant, but uh, what I, I I love this idea of circular housing, and I I think uh, I just think we need to uh, put our. Um, uh, I, I think we we should stop building square boxes. That uh, that's just all I wanted to say. I, yeah. I, I think we should <laughs> stop uh, making yeah. our ha housing square because it does something to us ener energetically. And and I think we should uh, make um, egg shape like in housing. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, the economic uh, uh, shapes are also important, and with three D printing. They're also already possible. Yeah, then they're still square now because of this concept is more practical. Uh, you can ship, not only ship it, but you can transport it more easily in smaller, yeah, yeah volumes. But okay, um, the the I I totally agree with you that uh, that is important to feel uh, comfortable and healthy. Yeah. Back to you, Angelo or Kimberly. Okay. I just want to share, it's just so beautiful. Um, just the, the vision and even everything in between, you know, all of the different steps of the different possibilities and different work opportunities. And um, even some like reframing, you know, universal, universal basic income as, um, I like seeing it as a holding action and one but not one of protest, like of just a better, a better way. And, and I think a lot of these things can be framed like that. Maybe that's part of the integration. You know, maybe we don't, it's not all, it's not all, well, it's protest, but can also, and something else. So, thank yeah. you. Yeah, totally. Thank you so much for being here. And your appreciation, Angelo. Yeah, um, just want to thank you, Robert, for um, for sharing and uh, sharing your vision and for inviting us to be part of it. And um, you know, we uh, we have your email and your your many projects, and hopefully, we can all find a way to fit in some way. Yeah, thanks. That was the last part uh, that we sort of uh, left out uh, the community participation. Um, Send, send us a, a message through uh, unity at hackhumanity.net and uh, if you want more information and uh, do share with people. You can share uh, the presentations freely and of course the videos, it's always helpful. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. It was right. wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good, Good afternoon. Yeah.
Bye. Bye. Much love. Bye-bye. Peace.